Hey there, everybody. This is the Social Distance Reading Series, a project of the Vermont School and Green Mountains Review. I'm Katherine Nernberger, author of Rue, published by BOA Editions. Thank you for joining me here in my dining room in St. Paul, Minnesota. My previous poetry collections are The End of Pink um, and Rag and Bone. My essay collections are Brief Interviews with the Romantic Past and The Witch of I, a book about witch trials which will be coming out in 2021. I teach in the MFA program at the University of Minnesota, and I'm very grateful to you all for joining me here in um, this strange place. Um, Rue, I like to tell people, is a book about plants historically used for birth control, but it's also very much about a different form of isolation, the kind I felt living for many years on a little farm in a conservative corner of rural Missouri. Um, I'll read you a poem now that will help set the milieu. It's called, I Want to Learn How. I want to learn how. Varieties of performance include being very nice, or when you want to instead cultivate a genuine friendship, you might be very mean, because who would perform meanness? Or, as the old axiom goes, true friends keep it real. But since authenticity is a performance like the rest, if you're still performing either way, it's probably nicer to play the part of nice. Unless your audience also longs for genuine friendship, which most nice people do, in which case you ought to be mean to them. Except for the part where mean is mean. Let's pause for a moment and define our terms. Nice is when Glenn, a man I barely know who frequents the only coffee shop in this town, interrupts my quiet morning with a book to ask about my garden while he runs his hand across my shoulder, at first like some sort of greeting, but then down my back, becoming bolder as I become more stiff and distant. I do not tell him this does not seem friendly at all, but rather like an end run around social prohibitions against copping a feel in public places on the bodies of women you don't really know. He is one of the men who owns this town. And I am a woman who moved here, but remains politically, socially, and religiously outside of here. So I say, nicely, tomorrow we're putting an okra. Mean is when Glenn, a retired police officer I talk about gardening with at the coffee shop, comes over to put his hand on my shoulder and then my back and I stop him and say, Glenn, that makes me uncomfortable when you touch me like that. We're only friendly acquaintances and that's a pretty intimate gesture. What to do? I can imagine Glenn's sad face when he realizes to his great embarrassment that he's been one of those pathetic old men touching and flirting with a younger woman who was just being nice, but getting angrier each time. I don't like that outcome. I don't want Glenn to feel he's been mean. It's not nice. I can also see how Glenn would a few hours or days later when the sorry wears off, tell the other men who run this town and sit together every morning drinking coffee what a frigid bitch I am. He might phrase it nicer than that because he's a Christian man as he likes to say. But then I would see the knowing eyes of those men everywhere I go. Among the men at Glenn's table are the town doctor, who I may need someday in an emergency to let touch me, and also administrators from my workplace. Sometimes I complain about how I can't decide what to do about Glenn to other men who are friends of mine and with whom I also work, and who at the office outrank me, but also have children my child likes to play with and wives I do not work with whose husbands my friends at work who outrank me have suggested I might like to go shop with. I think these men might know words I don't know for a situation like this one with Glenn because they are men and perhaps this is a socially constructed misunderstanding on my part. But no, they agree it seems pretty sexual and inappropriate and add that Glenn probably knows pretty well exactly what he's doing, as I suspected. They shrug and say, why don't you just tell him you don't like it? Or they shrug and say, what's the big deal? And I feel like they've never really imagined themselves inside such a situation and they don't really think about how to imagine it even now when I am asking so nicely that they try. Why are we even talking about something so small and inconsequential, they seem to suggest with their pinched tones and hunched shoulders. Nice is not talking about Glenn anymore. Mean is because I relive this coffee shop dilemma three plus times a week and it is the shop where my friendship with these other men unfolds too and because I like to work and think in coffee shops and I like many people and other talks I have in this shop, the only one within 30 miles of my house and place of work. And anyway, should we really solve the problem of harassment in such a cowardly, impotent way? I say, look, if we're really friends and if you don't want to be another of these microaggressive sexists perpetuating a patriarchal social system through an attitude of dismissiveness that makes it hard for some women to ever feel comfortable being themselves or saying what's on their minds, if that kind of authenticity is even possible, you should hear this story I'm telling as if it is a serious conundrum of a moral nature because it is not unreasonable for a woman to think she has a responsibility to address men crossing boundaries shamelessly for the purposes of making a woman into an object they feel free to touch, nor is it unreasonable for that same woman to worry that such correction in a town this small will make it hard for her to continue providing security and community for her family in a town where there are few jobs not at the chicken rendering facility 20 miles south on Highway 39. 
And so this small but unfixable situation will piss her off and she will want to talk about how she is pissed off in no small part because in general, she is the kind of woman who knows how to solve problems efficiently with little fanfare. And that is even one of the reasons you hired her and like her, if in fact you do like her. What to do? I see these men who have been friends of mine trying to arrange their sad faces because they like to think they themselves are feminists. They'd tell a man not to touch them in a heartbeat, they think, if it ever happened to them. They'd tell Glenn not to touch me if that's what I'm asking for. It is not at all what I am asking for. If I were mean enough to decide I really wanted us to understand and know each other, as true friends do, I don't know what I would say. I might say all this. And then they might say there are other words besides nice and mean. They might say there are other definitions. Perhaps they will tell them to me if I give them a reason. Or perhaps they will walk away and we will never speak of it again, as usually happens. So in this addled, lonely state, I started talking to the plants in my field behind my house. And by talking, I mean sustainably harvesting those plants for um, medicinal and food purposes, making jellies, making bouquets, but also actually talking to them a little, um, which is how I came to learn that many of the plants have been used as abortifacients. And that made me feel like maybe I wasn't the only pissed off radical feminist in town after all me and this Jane collective of plants out in the backyard, hanging out, being pissed. Um, I'll read you a poem called Penny Royale, which I understand from my research is um, pretty reliably efficacious as far as birth controls go, as long as you don't kill yourself when you use it, which you really can. So maybe stick with the birth control you have and work to keep it legal. Penny Royale. Penny Royale, smallest of the mints with weak prostrate stems. Penny Royale, a purple button for your pocket. Penny Royale, called run by the ground. Penny Royale, called lurk in the ditch. Penny Royale, it creepeth much and groweth much. It comes into blossom without any setting. Penny Royale, Pliny couldn't help himself going on at length. Penny Royale, creeping on my field for years. Penny Royale, before I knew what an old witch you really are, I brought you home to be a bouquet for my mother. Penny Royale, drunk with wine for venomous bites. Applied to nostrils with vinegar to revive those who faint and swoon. The inside of my body is very dark, I think. Or maybe the skin lets a light in, like when I close my eyes in the sun. Penny Royale, to relieve upset stomach. Penny Royale, to reduce flatulence. Penny Royale, active agent Pooligon, I'll meet you in the centrifuge. Penny Royale, to flavor hog pudding with pepper and honey. Strengthens the gums, helps the gout, cleanses the foul ulcers, drives out the fleas. Penny Royale, for menstrual derangements. Penny Royale to abort the thing. Penny Royale to kill the bitch. Penny Royale to take away the marks of bruises and blows about the eyes. Penny Royale asked and answered. By putting flies and bees in warm ashes of Penny Royale, they shall recover life as by the space of an hour and be revived. We're so many versions of ourselves. We try this, we try that. Sometimes we're efficacious. Sometimes we don't know what we're for. So another reason I wanted to write about these plants um, was because our state legislature was exploiting legal loopholes um, to shut down Planned Parenthoods across the state. Um, it started to feel like we might need these plant medicines again at some point, which is really um, disconcerting to imagine. Um, also, during the time I was working on this book, State Rep Todd Aiken was running for the Senate. Um, so Missouri State Rep Todd Aiken was running for a Senate seat on the platform that there is such a thing as legitimate rape. And um, also, of course, a pro-life platform. So I want to be clear that our present forms of legal birth control are the safest and most efficacious we've ever had, and we should keep them legal and available. Um, but I also want to tell you about silphium, which does seem to have been a plant form of birth control that worked quite well in the Roman Empire until the era of Caligula. Um, and then it was extincted as a result of human practices because we're good at that. This poem is called Regarding Silphium, the birth control of the Roman Empire for 600 years, extincted by careless land management in the year 200 AD. When I was just about done being married and he was a blossomed out nerve of seeing himself through the ugly eyes of how I had come to see him and myself for letting our lives get so Tupperware fur molded, for thinking I could lace and pinprick it back with just the right delicacy when a good punch in the face was what a mess this bad required. I know, you're thinking a punch in the face is never the answer, but that's the least talking. 
When I was just about done with the lace-throated maybe violence, our daughter, who is five, told me how he broke. She didn't say he broke. She said he got really worked up, driving past all the protesters outside Planned Parenthood on Providence Avenue, from which the University Medical School had just withdrawn funding and also the option for residents to do training there. How he took a hard left into the parking lot and with our daughter by the hand, marched in with an urgency that made the young man working the desk say, sir, with some alarm. He took a breath to be more steady and said, I'm so sorry about all this, all that out there. And I just thought I'd make a donation. As he pulled all the money from his wallet, some of it crumpled, a mixture of fives and ones and pushed it across the counter, our daughter watching and looking around the room, studying the faces of timid and nervous young women, I imagine, in those plastic chairs I remember from where I once sat in this exact waiting room myself so many years ago, feeling embarrassed and ashamed because it seemed that's what I was supposed to feel. Though if I could have felt my way beyond supposed to back then, back to my actual self, I would have known I didn't feel sorry at all only annoyed by the tedium of appointments, the practical necessity of that clean smell, the chilly dustless air of a building with nothing soft except the aspect of a resident, who is the only doctor I've ever had who choked as she put her gloved hand in my body. I guess this is the most awkward thing you'll do today, huh? It was funny and made me feel like we'd been friends a long time. My husband, who is still my husband after all, knew that story, and I guess he wanted our daughter to somehow know it too. Sometimes you'll feel very alone, I tell her on a day when I find her pressing her face against the window, watching the children next door play in the grass, wiping tears from her face as fast as they fall. Other times you'll be so wonderfully surprised by these strange bridges people manage to build out to you when you never would have expected they could. So um, when I was writing this book, for most of it, I thought for sure I was going to get a divorce. Um, and um, my husband really didn't want to, and he said he'd do anything, and anything it turned out included reading Adrienne Rich and Audre Lorde, and um, it really helped a lot, actually. Um, and throughout those, those, that hard year, um, he's always been my editor, and he kept reading drafts. He wanted to keep reading the drafts of these poems, um, which I guess is um, one way to do marriage counseling. Um, so I'd give him these poems, and he'd pass it back, and he'd be like, well, if this is gonna work, I have to make the husband a much worse villain than this, or like, super painful, send it out. Um, so I guess I thought it would be nice to, um, do two things. One, I, um, I love a good condom and I wanted to include, uh, condoms in my, um, birth control series. So I, um, learned that condoms were once made of lambskin. Um, so this is about that. And it's also, um, it's the closest thing a cynical, cranky person like me can do to get towards writing a love poem. The poem's called The Real Thing. Sir John Mandeville the great explorer and liar claimed there grows a kind of fruit as big as a gourd and when it is ripe men open it and find inside an animal of flesh and blood and bone like a little lamb without wool. He called this the vegetable lamb of Tartari. I first learned of it from a very old hippie who was feeling lonesome one lavender night of a misty joint for the lambskin condoms of his soft-hearted youth and also most likely for a time when women in their 20s heard such a line with more thrill and less derision. A time when he didn't get on a bicycle and think about his prostate, get on a woman and think about his grave. When Trojan brought them back as a mass market consumable experiment in nostalgia and the idea of the natural, my husband, who would prefer to have another child, truth be told, bought a box for us to try. After, we assessed. I've had better sex, but there was a sort of hallucinatory flower opening at the end, so that's something. I've been reading about hallucinatory flowers lately, particularly the ones used by medieval midwives to induce abortion. This because I like irony, I like control, and I like to see a woman flipping the patriarchy the bird. In my daily life though, I stick with condoms because once the roots are in you, it's no mean feat to get them out. It will feel like and be a measure of poison. I think of the women who once did the washing at the river with a pair of stones in the meat of their arms. I admire, but would not care to be them. When I took the little hormone pills, I always worried I wasn't smelling things, pheromones of men, lilacs, coffee, puddles around the gas station, as they were meant to be smelled. Meant to be, I'm learning, is a dangerous notion. Goethe said there was meant to be an Erpflanz, an archetypal plant and prototype containing all plants, past and future. He could draw it, but after many years of travel and searching, had to conclude there is, nevertheless, no such thing. After equally many years, I'm starting to worry that I am missing the point of my life. Was I meant to be the ovary of a green calyx always getting fatter? How will I think when I die? I worry there can be nothing worse than realizing your life wasn't what it was meant to be. 
The vegetable lamb of Tartari, Mandeville reports, grazed the leaves of its mother until its umbilical vine dropped off. Then it became a lamb like any other, with meat for slaughter and skin that is said to feel as translucently delicate as a petal. Is a petal meant to chafe? I told my husband sometimes there's great and sometimes there's good enough. He said from his point of view, there wasn't really much difference and what difference there was wasn't an improvement so much as a variation. So we went to sleep, content enough, perhaps content as we were meant to be, perhaps shades of that. Thank you all very much for listening to my poems. Um, I could really go on forever and ever about plants, um, but I am out of time. Um, and um, I'm sure you're feeling a little out of time in your life too. Um, I mean with work, not more metaphorically than that. Um, I'm not gonna go off script anymore. That's always a bad idea. I am supposed to tell you, I'm supposed to repeat, my book is Rue. It was published by Boa Editions. It's available from your favorite local indie bookstore. Mine is moonpalacebooks.com. They could probably use our business right now. But you can also order the book from my, the book from my publisher's website, which is boaeditions.org. They could also probably use some sales right now. Um, if you enjoyed my poems, you might also enjoy Tess Taylor's extraordinary book, Rift Zone, just out this spring from Red Hen Press. It explores... Um, earthquakes and other crises and catastrophes, including land grabs, Japanese internment, mass evictions, and other crimes against the land and the people who live on it. Um, it's a really powerful and moving book. I think you'll like it a lot. Um, thanks so much. I hope you are all well out there. You're feeling well, supported, handling the stress okay. Um, all my best wishes to all of you.